Good morning, everyone, and thanks for joining us for a new year of learning with QI Power Hour. I'm Chelsea Schwartz of the Health Quality Council, and so excited to see the chat happening already uh, on the webinar this morning. Uh, for those of you joining QI Power Hour for the first time, uh, this is a free monthly webinar learning series hosted by the Health Quality Council here in Saskatchewan. We bring together improvers from a variety of sectors with an interest in improving health to learn about quality improvement related topics. Uh, so all of our sessions are recorded and available on our HQC website following the event. Uh, so for those of uh, you who have colleagues that weren't able to join the live session, uh, we certainly welcome you to share out the link with uh, those folks. Uh, and we also welcome you to maybe catch up on some past sessions uh, that you may have missed. And while you're on our HQC website, we do invite you to sign up for our distribution list to ensure that you receive regular invites for all of our upcoming QI Power Hour sessions. So over the last year, we've been really excited to see the continued spread and growth of QI Power Hour uh, throughout our home province of Saskatchewan uh, and even the rest of uh, Canada and even abroad. So thank you for choosing to spend an hour of your time with us uh, and for your commitment to your own ongoing learning to improve the systems that you are each part of. So before we get into Helen's presentation this morning, I know that we are super jazzed to have her here with us this morning. Um, we are looking forward to your engagement and participation on the webinar today, and I'm just going to spend a couple of minutes uh, to just tell you how you can do just that. Uh, so I see that most of you uh, have already found the chat function, uh, but for those of you who uh, may be new to the world of webinars, uh, I'll just give you a, a quick overview of how you can do that. Um, so some of you may have noticed that in uh, the past few months, the WebEx interface has looked a little bit different. Uh, so you can now find access to the chat function uh, towards the bottom of your page. If you just hover over, uh, a toolbar will appear, and you can click the, the message bubble icon, and it will launch the chat function on the right-hand side of your screen. So we encourage folks to uh, do as you've been doing and build that sense of community uh, by sharing your questions and your insights uh, during today's session. Uh, we also invite you to uh, start posting your questions. Uh, Helen will take, uh, spend about 15 to 20 minutes, depending on the time that we have, towards the end of the session answering your questions. Uh, so we have folks dedicated here uh, at the Health Quality Council this morning that will be monitoring the chat. Uh, we also have some dedicated tech support, so if you are um, having any issues, uh, feel free to reach out to Caroline on the tech support. Uh, so let's just take a moment to practice. Um, maybe some of you that haven't yet uh, made use of the chat function, let's just take a moment to practice by sharing the organization uh, that you're joining us from today. College of Medicine, 3S Health, the Saskatchewan Health Authority, eHealth. Perfect, excellent. So. I am feeling very confident that folks have found the chat function, so thanks so much. The next function that we want to introduce you to today uh, is the annotation function. So this one you can access on the far left-hand side of your screen uh, by just clicking on this annotation icon that looks like a little, a little squiggle there. Uh, so you can click on that uh, and it will launch a toolbar to uh, the left of that. Uh, and we encourage you to click on the arrow annotation. There we go, I see that the annotation's working, and indicate where uh, on the map that you're joining us from this morning. Perfect, welcome Kyla, Dale, Sherry, Kath. Great, so we're starting to see the spread. We have some great representation I see from our home province in Saskatchewan, uh, but also some folks joining us from across um, across the country, and a couple of folks representing there from uh, the UK, excellent. Good, so that gives us a bit of a sense of uh, who's on the call today in terms of our group of improvers. And uh, just one other way that you uh, might choose to join the conversation today. Uh, so we do encourage you, if you're a, a fan of Twitter and uh, active in the Twitter sphere, we encourage you to use the hashtag QI Power Hour so that we can all follow the same conversation. And if you'd like to track someone um, or take someone specifically, you can use the handles that you see listed on your screen there. 
so with that, let's dive into our session today. Um, Personally, it's a real honor for me to be able to introduce uh, our speaker today. Uh, Helen is a recognized thought leader and change agent uh, for healthcare improvement, um, and frankly, one of my personal QI heroes. So uh, Helen is one of the top social influencers in healthcare globally, reaching more than a million people each month through her social media connections, virtual presentations, commentary, and blogs. She holds uh, formally the role of Chief Transformation Officer with the Horizons Group, with the National Health Services in England. And we're also fortunate enough to be able to call her a friend of our province. So she's been coming to Saskatchewan for the past 13 years. Um, and we've been uh, really grateful to be able to um, have her provide us insights and inspiration and ad advice uh, as we've embarked on our own Saskatchewan healthcare system journey. So we've continued to grow and evolve and mature um, over the past decade, uh, very much in support of uh, um, very much thanks to her support. So, Helen, welcome to QI Power Hour. I'll pass things over to you. Thank you, um, Chelsea, very much. And welcome, everybody, to our session, which is around a world that is changing very quickly and how we lead change and improvement in that world. And just in terms of how we're going to manage this session, I think with, with virtual sessions like this, um, I don't like them if you know you have a speaker for a long time and then a few questions and answers at the end. So what we're doing is we're interspersing this session uh, with a with a few polls and interesting activities. Um, what I'm also um, going to do is um, I'm going to um, uh, ask a couple of people to help me today, and um, they are Laura and uh, Laura's job is to is to us to manage the chat box. So what I really want you to do, you know, as we go through this session today, if you've got any comments, um, if you've got uh, any any challenges, um, any resources that you know about, um, please put a, a comment in the chat box and add it to all participants. So we know we can uh, we can work in a in a parallel way. So we're both uh, listening. Uh, uh, and contributing to the uh, the actual session, and we've got a parallel session um, going on in the in the chat box. And what's also going to happen? Um, Heidi from the Health Quality Council is looking after uh, things on Twitter. So uh, when we stop to find out what's been happening in the chat box, um, we're also going to ask Heidi to tell us what's been happening in. Uh, in the Twitter sphere as uh, as well. So so here's to a, a really great session today. And as Chelsea said, um, uh, you know I've just um, always had such a great relationship with uh, Saskatchewan uh, for such a long time. And I think that um, people that lead healthcare improvement in Saskatchewan are very brave, very courageous. You know always willing uh, to try new things, um, to learn and to share. And I think have have many values that are important to me. So I'm really delighted uh, to be here uh, today. So uh, yeah, welcome to everyone. So wherever you are in, in Canada, in North America, in the world, I'm really pleased to see you. Now, you know, when we think, you know, about the, the, the changes that are coming, where the world is going, very often what many futurists are talking about is we're moving from an information age where key workers are information workers to an imagination age, which is about creativity, pattern recognition, you know, making meaning. And, uh, you know, we can see why this is happening, I think, because as we move into a world that is more and more about artificial intelligence and machine learning, that many of the information tasks that have been the most valuable tasks in our world now uh, will be done um, will be done by machines so we're moving into a world that um, where creativity I think will be some of the most value uh, creating activities you know uh, I am um, I took these slides here from the wonderful Joran Henriks uh, from yeah young shipping in Sweden and you know what he talks about is you know, the, the, the main way that we as humans will create value will be through imagination and, and creativity. And the way that we interact with each other and the way that we create um, structures uh, will be more and more through film-based 
uh, platforms. And, you know, we look at what's happening with virtual reality. We look what's happening uh, around cyberspace. And again, it's all it's all raising the value of work that is based on imagination, art, creativity. So, you know, when, when I think about my own work as a healthcare improver and the work of my team, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to work more and more in ways that are fit for purpose um, for the imagination age. So, um, so what you'll see in um, a lot of these slides are, uh, are sketch notes and, uh, and graphics. And, and here's the first one. And what we're talking about is, you know, thinking about uh, how we go about improvement in an exponentially changing world. So I'll start here in the bottom left hand corner. You know, when we think about even in the last decade, our ability to, uh, to share information, to build relationships, to connect uh, with people all over the world has been transformed. If we carry up, you know, when we look at what's happening in terms of genomics and, and other factors and the way that they will change the face of, um, of healthcare, you know, even in 10 years' time, things will look very, very different. If we move over to the top right-hand corner there and we look at, you know, increases in our older population and what that will mean. So where I live in the centre of England, you know, what's being forecast is that one in, th one in three children born in my city today will live to be 100, okay? one in three. So, you know, when we think about the societal implications of that, I think it's pretty profound. As we go down from the, 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 from the, um, on the right here, the next thing I've put on this slide is, is the Me Too movement. And, you know, very often, you know, those of us that are interested in the spread and scale of change, you know, we, we've all had the lecture that says change takes a very long time to happen. And, you know, an innovation that, that starts in one part of the world, even when there's great evidence for it, may take years. And, and I think that's shifting too. You know, even in the last two years, we think about the Me Too movement and the sense in which, you know, things that were happening that were wrong, that many people knew about, but were allowed to happen where there was silence. Um, you know, it, I mean, just things are changing fundamentally. As we, um, as we move down, I actually put a, guard, a headline from a newspaper here, which um, says one in four Europeans are voting for populist parties. You know, what, what, we, what we mean by that? You know, um, when we think about populist parties, you know, these are uh, political parties that are outside of the political uh, mainstream. I mean, most of them are extremely right wing, uh, anti-immigration, um, fear-driven movements that are basically saying, you know, we have to challenge uh, the, the current order in, in very fundamental ways and, and often, you know, um, based on negativity, okay? A, a decade ago, 7% of people in Europe were voting for those parties. Now it's 25%. And we see things happening, you know, all over the world that really are unexpected. When we see, you know, um, uh, election results, uh, you know, in, um, in Hungary or in, in Sweden, um, in the USA, uh, you look at what's happening in, in my country now in, very, in a very real way every day when, uh, when we struggle with the results of the Brexit elections the Brexit, Brexit referendum. And, you know, so much of this is that people just don't trust the social order um, anymore in the ways I think that we took for granted a little while ago. And then the final point I've got here in the bottom right-hand corner is the end of Moore's Law. And, and Moore's Law is a, a law that basically, if you look back to 1965, what it shows us is that um, every year, since 1965, computational power has doubled, okay? Moving forward at an, uh, an, uh, um, an exponential rate. So just to give you a sense of this, when you think about um, the first missions to the moon 50 years ago, and you think about your own smartphone, okay? We have more computational power in a single smartphone than an Apollo mission did um, to take people to the moon. Okay. And, you know, even that's changing because in January 2018, 
Moore's law didn't apply anymore. Actually, the speed at which our computational power is, is moving forward is faster than Moore's law. And um, uh, I just took a, um, a comment here from the futurist Ryan Arshad. You know, in five years, our technology is going to be 32 times better than it is now. In 10 years, it's going to be a thousand times better. And in 20 years, it will be a million times you know, uh, more advanced. So this is a very, very exponentially moving world. And yet, you know, um, things might not be uh, changing in terms of healthcare improvements. So let's have a couple of polls. So, um, so the first poll is, to what extent do you think that healthcare improvers need to change their mindsets, approaches, and methods in a changing world? So when you think about what, you know, um, healthcare or whatever sector you're in and you know the, the methods and tools for improvement that you're in you know to what extent do you think that they uh, they need to to uh, to change in a changing world so um, if you look to the right hand side of your screen okay um, there is a there's a poll there so can you click uh, the, uh, the the letter for the statement um, that you most agree with. And it's very important. At the bottom, there's a little um, panel that is submit. So you need to submit your idea. Okay. I'll just tell you what we're seeing come across, uh, Helen, as they're, yeah. as they're completing it. Uh, a lot of strongly agree so far. Uh, a few agree. Yeah. yeah. Probably, probably right. what you expected. Yeah, it's what I expected. Um, yeah, so, uh, over let, half the yeah, folks, they um, strongly agree. Yeah, that's right. Um, thank you, Chelsea. And um, so let's do another one. So we're, we're, we're mostly agreeing and strongly agreeing that we, we need to change what we do. Um, but, you know, to what extent is that happening? So, again, I'm going to give you um, uh, another poll here, uh, which goes from, uh, from, from one to five. And... Um, uh, and to what extent are you, and it could be you individually or your team, whatever works best for you, um, to what extent are you already preparing for or investing in new improvement te uh, uh, techniques and approaches for a world that's changing? And I want you to give yourself a score somewhere between five, which means, you know, um, we are always reviewing, continually reviewing our improvement methods and approaches and adding new ones and changing what we do, to uh, number one, we like to stick to the methods we know and which work, work well for us now. So give yourself a score somewhere between five, which is, yeah, you know, we're, we're, we're always constantly changing our improvement methods and updating them and trying to do things in ways that are right for a new world, down to one, which means we like to stick with what we know works for us now. So honestly, where do you think you are or, um, or your team is? And I'll let you see again what we're, or I'll let you know what we're seeing coming through here. Uh, definitely the majority of the folks coming through uh, in the middle of the pack, so rating three. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, not too many on, on the lower end of the spectrum. So we, you can tell that That's we have good. a group yeah. of, of constant improvers here who are always looking yeah. to do things differently. Yeah. Um, and I think maybe it's the fact that people, um, you know, who um, who like to um, update and are curious and want to do new things would be attracted uh, to come to a session like this about um, about methods in a new world. So I guess it's not surprising. And thank you, um, thanks everybody for voting, and thanks um, Chelsea for um, uh, letting that vote happen. But you know, what I'd say, you know, when we look across the world, I would say that many of the ways that we go about improving health and care or other aspects of public service were designed um, in a different mindset for a different set of circumstances. And very often, you know, where we are now, we're in a rapidly changing 21st century world, but a lot of the techniques and approaches and the mindsets that we're operating with are, are from a different era. And then just give an example of that. You know, when I look across the, the world um, of health and care, and I don't think other aspects of the public se service are very different to that, you know, um, one thing that hasn't changed very much is, is, um, is the structures that we have as organizations. So I've got a, a picture here of the tabulating machine company of 1917. 
And the tabulating machine company in 1917, it made complete sense that the way that it organized what it did was in departments and directorates because the kind of work that the tabulating machine company did was you know, it was very standardized, it was very predictable and uh, routine. Where change was happening, it was happening uh, very slowly and incrementally. So having this kind of organizational structure with departments and directorates was absolutely um, the right thing to do. But, you know, structures like this, uh, which are the kind of structures that every health and care organization that I know has, okay, don't work so well in a rapidly uh, changing world because, you know, um, a structure like this, um, a, a hierarchy uh, was designed to be very stable and constant and avoid risks. And, and we're in a world that's extremely um, fast moving. So, you know, trying to cascade change down uh, through an organizational structure like this, first of all, it's very slow. And secondly, the very nature of this kind of structure okay, is, is risk averse. And very often when we're trying to do radical, rapidly different things, we have to take some risks. So, you know, what I'm saying isn't anti-hierarchy. Okay? I actually don't know a single organization anywhere in the world that doesn't have some kind of hierarchical structure to it. What I am saying is on its own, it just doesn't work as well as it used to. And at the heart of this, you know, thinking about uh, where our world's going and how things are changing, okay, is the issue of power. And power is changing. And I like this quote from Bertrand Russell, the father of modern logic, and he says, power is the ability to produce intended effects. So in a sense, you know, we are moving from a world that is about um, formal power, uh, what I'd call old power, okay, to power in a different way. So one of the models that I really um, like to work with is this one. And uh, this is from a book that was published um, last year by Hymans and Tims about, about new power. And it contrasts um, this new power with old power. So let's just talk about the two. Okay. Old power is like a currency. It's like money. A few people have got a lot of it, but most of us haven't. Okay. So it's formal authority in organizations and it's held by a few people and it's pushed down the organization and we're commanded. So, so people in an old power structure are told, you know, you have to do this because it's in the objectives. You have to do this because it's the operational plan. You have to do this because it's the government standard or the government performance target. And old power is closed. So, you know, if I'm the senior leader of a health region, and my power ends at the at the door of my organization because if if I'm doing uh, work with local community leaders or patient leaders and families, you know I haven't got any uh, authority over them. And old power is largely transactional. It's about holding people to account. It's about governance mechanisms. It's about structures and systems and processes. Okay, let's contrast that with new power. New power is like a current, a source of energy. And the, it's, it's made by people coming together, by many people, people with similar values and uh, similar goals. And the thing about old power, the more people that engage in it, the more power we have. So, you know, we can pull it into our organizations and systems. It, it's shared, it's open. Anybody that shares our goals can largely um, be, be part of our movement. And it's based on relationships and connections. You see, one of the big differences between old power and new power is that, you know, um, when it comes to old power, you know, uh, you have to do it because it's the performance target. Um, it's the, it's the, the, the quality standard, you know, it's the, um, it's the operating system. But with new power, people are choosing um, to engage in it. And if I you know, get involved in a new power movement and I expect changes to happen and uh, I trust that they'll happen and they don't happen, then I won't engage again. So, you know, it's, it's highly relational. 
Now, it's very important with old power, new power, uh, not to put um, any uh, judgment on it. I'm not saying old power good, new power is the new way, it's, it's better. I get, um, you see, I can't think of a single health and care organisation that I know anywhere in the world um, that, that you know, isn't built on, on strong um, old power principles. I mean, maybe there's one or two, but most of them aren't, you know. Um, uh, and, um, you, know, you know, what I'd say is as, as change agents, as, imp as improvement leaders, we need to be able to operate in a world that works with both old power and new power. Um, together. I'd say in our sector, old power is very strong, but increasingly we're seeing a layer of new power on the top that is creating all kinds of, um, of opportunities um, for change. We need to be able to operate in that very difficult um, zigzaggy place in the middle. And again, you know, I can think of so many people that I know, um, clinical entrepreneurs, um, patient activists who had really great ideas that could have made a, a difference to a lot of different patients or a lot of different people, okay? And they're working in new power ways and they don't know how to navigate the old power system. So they end up being like a thousand flowers blooming, you know, things don't happen. I also know a number of formal leaders who tried to make really big changes happen by changing the structure on its own. And again, it doesn't create sustainable change because we're not changing what's in people's hearts, you know, and we have to work with both. Very often, um, people will say to me, you know, I can't make change happen because um, I'm only a resident or I'm only a staff nurse or I'm only an improvement manager. But, you know, the reality is that people that work in, in new power ways based on connections and engagement can really make um, a, an awful lot of change happen. Um, I took this from uh, Leandro Herrera, who writes about uh, viral change. You know, he says, you know, people that work in new power ways who are highly connected um, typically have got twice as much power to influence change as people with hierarchical power, you know, people that work in old power ways. We need, um, we need to be able to, um, to work with both. Now, um, one of the, um, the big trends, okay, new ways of working, new methods uh, that we're seeing over the, uh, over the past period has been the growth in organizational network analysis, ONA, which enables us to really understand power and influence in organizations. I've taken this from uh, a Danish organization that we work with, uh, which does ONA, Organizational Network Analysis, called InnoVisor. Okay. InnoVisor has worked with um, uh, hundreds of, um, of organizations. And what it sees time and time again, you know, when it, when it looks at the, the trends and connections and relationships in organizations, is that typically there's about 3% of people in an organization or a system that drive conversations with and influence 85% of, um, of other people. And you see, we call these people the super connectors. So if we want to make change happen in our organizational system, we need to find the super connectors. And if the, if the super connectors, you know, are, um, are advocating the change that we want to make happen, then we're in a really good place because they're, they're influencing so many um, different people. If we've got a scenario where the super connectors are actually um, against the change that we're trying to make happen, it's really, really hard um, to, uh, uh, to get there and to implement a change. When you've got, when you've got super connectors who are actually organizing against uh, the changes that their organization is trying to make, um, it's, it's really problematic. So people say, how can you find your super connectors? How can we find our 3%? Well, there's a number of ways you can do it. You know, you can call in a company that does ONA and they'll, they'll do analysis for you, okay? Another way that you can do it is just ask, you know, who are our super connectors? So, um, so here's a very typical super connector um, that, um, that I know. So um, this is Mandy Carney, and Mandy is a middle, middle manager at Yeovil Hospital um, in England, and uh, she's got a job of head of patient flow. How do we know that Mandy is a super connector? Well, first of all, when you talk to people um, about Mandy, they, the first thing they say, well, she knows everyone. She knows everyone in the whole hospital. And actually, if you wanted to get a sense 
of her um, influence and connection, you just have to go onto a Facebook page, okay? And it, when you when you go onto Mandy's Facebook page, it seems like hundreds of people that work at the hospital all follow Mandy. And Mandy um, is a very, very powerful person. Even though, she, you know, uh, she's a middle manager, people go to her. And what she, and she does what lots of super connectors do, which is that she makes sense of things for people. So if there's something happening in this hospital system and people want to know what does it mean, what's going on, you know, she makes sense of things. She's a meaning maker. She's a sense maker. She's reducing ambiguity for people. Again, which makes her very powerful. And um, I mean, what's kind of what's great is that the the leadership at Yeovil Hospital have worked have kind of sussed this out, worked this out. So they've given Mandy a job of being head of patient flow, and her job is to, you know, uh, enable patients to flow through uh, the hospital at a stage that's 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 right for them in terms of their clinical needs and their wants, and to uh, and to to help to remove any blockages that stop the things happening to patients that should be happening to them or that patients want to happen. And because she knows everybody, she's the perfect person for this job. And she even has her own monthly award. It's called the Carney Cup. And uh, Mandy gives the Carney Cup to the team that is making the most progress or uh, you know, does the best improvements in terms of enabling patients to flow through the system. And people covet you know, teams are so thrilled when they get this uh, this cup. You know, um, um, everybody wants it. Now, you might say, well, are these three percent? Are they the most senior people in um, in our organisations? And the answer is typically no. And in fact, most senior leaders in organisations do not know who their influencers, who their uh, who their super connectors are. So, you know, when we talked about this before, when I talked about it, I said typically. The 3% will be driving conversations or influencing 85% of the other people. What InnoVisor also tell us is that in a typical organization or, or system, about 12% of people have got a role that can be described as a senior leadership role. And those 12% are driving conversations and influencing only 55% of other people. Okay, so our informal influencers, the 3%, are driving conversations with 85%. And the formal influencers, the 12%, are driving conversations with 55% of people. And you know what it means is that um, typically senior leaders are less influential than we think they are. Because, again, what the InnoVisor data shows us is if you want to work in old power ways and cascade change down, if you want to get the same level of influence through top-down change, cascading, as the 3% the super connectors get through working in new power ways with, uh, with inf you know, uh, informal um, influence, you need four times more people to do it. Okay, um, I'm just going to give notice. Um, to Laura and Heidi that uh, in a couple more slides, I'm just going to pause and I'm going to ask you to just sum up very quickly what's happening in the chat room and what's happening in, in Twitter. So Laura and Heidi, uh, be ready. Now, what's also interesting is that that 3% rule, the super connector rule, is also seems to be true for social media. If you look at what's happening in health and healthcare globally, what we can see is that tweets by uh, three, just over 3% of people who tweet account for 85% of retweets, so exactly the same ratio. 85% of the content that gets retweeted on social media comes from 3% uh, of, um, of people who, um, who tweet. I'm going to show you something now, which is a social media map. Okay? Um, let me just explain uh, what's going on. Okay? If you look on the left-hand side of this map, what we can see there is, um, is the social media, the Twitter account for a large corporate body okay, in, uh, in the National Health Service in England. And if you look at this corporate body, you'd think, wow, they're really influential and they're very good at Twitter because they've got 250,000 followers, a quarter of a million followers, and they've also got a team of um, of communications professionals who every day are putting out a whole series of highly informative um, tweets. Okay? How, so if you look on the left-hand side and you see that shape that looks like an egg, you know, that is um, a corporate account that is, that is very active. 
However, if you look around the edge of it, can you see there's a very thin line? Okay. What that basically means is that, that this corporate body is putting a lot of uh, information out. Okay. It's broadcasting. It's a one-way street. But it's not very influential because that very thin line around the edge means that not, many, not very many people are picking this up and retweeting it and passing it on. Okay? It's, it's, it's going out one way as a broadcast. If you look in the middle of this diagram, what you see are what we call the medical super connectors. Okay? These are a group of clinicians. They're, they're not only doctors, but they're mostly doctors who are really influential. Okay? They work in new power ways. Okay? Most of them are not very senior, uh, but they have got a good reputation and uh, people trust them. And so what happens is anything that they tweet out, other people pick it up and retweet it and retweet it. So if you can see, there's like a circle in the middle and then there's a series of concentric circles, okay? That is very effective um, uh, social media approaches uh, because you've got a, 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 social, a super connector in the middle, one of the 3% of people that gets 85% of the retweets, and whatever they tweet, loads and loads of other people are tweeting it out. So you can see, if you look at this diagram in its... In its um, in its totality, okay, can you see the little green lines that are going from the big corporate accounts to the, to the super connectors? What that's telling us is where, um, where the, the big corporate account just puts things out and broadcasts it, it doesn't go very far. However, if one of their tweets um, um, gets tweeted by a super connector, it goes a long way out. Now, um, I'm not saying that this is like one corporate body that isn't doing this well. What I'm saying is you could, a lot of you work for big um, uh, corporate healthcare organizations. I can almost guarantee that if you did the same analysis with, um, with your corporate social media, it would look like this. And what it basically means is that rather than doing you know, one-way broadcasting, um, actually, if, if big corporate accounts found out who their super connectors were, and then when they wanted to get messages out, got their super connectors to put the messages out for them, uh, it, they would be much more influential in terms of the messages. And you know, there's a big lesson here. And the lesson is, most of our messages stay in the echo chamber. You know, what do we mean by the echo chamber? What we mean is very often, you know, we're doing a lot of broadcasting, we're putting messages out, but the messages don't spread. They just stay in the echo chamber of people like us. And, you know, for those of us that are in the healthcare improvement movement, I'd say, you know, um, we could accuse us of the echo chamber as well, because very often, you know, the improvement initiatives we're doing and the way that we're trying to get them out, they just go to the enthusiasts and the zealots, and, and you know, we need to think, uh, uh, how can we get past the echo chamber? You know, the same people that think the way we do, how can we connect more broadly? And I want to suggest um, two things, okay? The first thing I want to suggest is the way in which we are connecting with families, um, patients, and, uh, and, and citizens. You know, um, if you look again at what's happening on social media, not just in health and care, but across the whole of social media, what it shows us is that very often patients, um, well, well, beyond patients, people who are living with long-term conditions and people who are living with cancer are some of the most engaged and active audiences anywhere on social media. And when we look at research, what it shows us is, first of all, patients and service users um, can gain an, um, a massive amount of power by using social media for health-related purposes. And we mean power in multiple ways. We mean activation and um, uh, our own sense of power in terms of our own health, but also power in terms of being very influential with other people. And the research shows that where um, people with long-term conditions and cancer uh, become active and gain power through social media, it actually improves their relationships with their own healthcare professionals. What we can also see, though, is that there's quite a significant amount of overt um, uh, opposition and behind the scenes opposition from some healthcare professionals. But the reality is, you know, even in a world where there's an awful lot of fake news and fake information, actually, our patients trust social media. 
So we need to be their trusted source and we need to break out of the echo chamber in the way that we're doing things. And we need to be connecting with our patients, families and citizens um, in, um, in, in different ways. And then um, we also need to be thinking about how we connect with our staff. You know, many of our, of our staff who are active on social media, they are super connectors. And typically, our employees have got 10 times more connections than, uh, than our corporate um, social media accounts. They're far more influential than our corporate accounts. So what we need to be doing is we need to be understanding that, we need to be doing the analysis, we need to understand who our super connectors are, and we need to be giving power to our staff to be the voice of our organisation. Because they've got audience and, um, and, uh, and our staff have also got that credibility um, to get us beyond the echo chamber and to help us uh, to, be, uh, to be truly influential. And we're going to have a poll in a minute, but um, just before I do that, I'm uh, just going to, um, first of all, I'm going to ask uh, Laura, um, quickly sum up with what we're seeing in the chat room. Okay, what are the big uh, messages coming out of the chat room? Sure, Helen. Um, so far, not any questions, but lots of comments on uh, people making connections with what you've been saying to either things they've read or things they've experienced in work. So uh, Chelsea and I are trying to probe people with other questions, so hopefully some more things will come through soon. Yeah, and I think, you know, it's great as well if you can just, if, um, you know, if people don't want to ask questions specifically, um, you know, let's, um, uh, you know, I can, co I can comment on the comments. So, um, so that's great. And um, no, thank you, um, uh, uh, thank you, Laura. And Heidi, um, what's happening in the Twitter sphere? So what are we, we hearing have, or seeing? We don't have um, specific uh, like questions just yet. We do have Angie kind of posing a question from the content to others, just kind of uh, what they think. And she kind of asked, a change in mindset is required. How, how often do we review and improve the things we do? Um, yeah. And then, um, Bertrand Russell's uh, quote, power is the ability to produce intended effects, uh, really resonated with folks on here. Um, I'm just looking here. The super connectors and Mandy really seem to uh, strike a chord with a lot of folks as well. Yeah, great. So, uh, so yeah, so who are your Mandy's? Very good. Yeah. Um, thank you. Um, thank you so much, Heidi, and, um, and, and keep looking for us. That's great. Um, Brilliant. So, um, so I think what we'll do now is um, uh, we'll have another another poll, and again, Chelsea is going to help us with this. So it's another one of these um, these scales. So our, our question is: To what extent is social media a key part of your team's improvement practice? Okay. So in in terms of what we're trying to do, you know, how we're trying to get the message out and, and connect and have relationships around improvement. Okay. Again, somewhere between five, which is we have an active collective approach to social media with a particular focus on aims, like how can our social media um, strategy support our improvement aims and also through our influencers, through to a one would mean some individuals in my team use social media, but there isn't a coordinated approach. So where are you somewhere between that one and five? In the extent to which social media is part of your team's improvement practice, so um, so please um, please vote now and don't forget to press the submit button. How are we doing, Chelsea? Hi, Helen. Just uh, looking at the responses coming in, and we're definitely trending towards the lower end of the spectrum. So a lot of ones. Uh, we actually had a comment that said, "Is there a zero option?" So <laughs> okay, uh, only you, a, a yeah. handful of folks feeling strong uh, on the fours and fives, but the majority yeah. indicating that they're a, a one or a two. Yeah, you know, um, and you know what I'd say? It's um, it's not going away, and. Um, uh, you know, I mean, there's people that are taking part um, today, like uh, like Nicola, who I was talking to in the chat room um, earlier. You know, like Nick and I, we, we've we've never met, but we know each other uh, because we're um, we're fellow improvement activists on um, on Twitter, and um, you know, it's um, yeah, it, it's um, it's I think what we should be doing. Um, thank you for everybody for polling, and uh, and thanks Chelsea. So you know, um, again, here's one of our um, imagination age um, graphic. So what I tried to do here in, in one drawing is to say, you know, um, 
uh, what's happening around uh, around large scale change? What are some of the big directions? Now, if you look at this overall, what you see here, I'm not saying from to, um, uh, because it's a bit like old power, new power, you know? We're not going from old power to new power, okay? What we're doing is um, we're, we're in a world where the balance is changing, okay? We're in a world where old power is very strong, but actually we're seeing more and more new power change. And it's about, it's about both. So I think we're moving into a world where there's you know, more, much more focus on networks and communities and informal power. And while we keep working with formal power, we must do, um, we know we need to be working um, you know, with, the, with the informal processes as well. Okay? That's, that's where things are going. Okay? And you know, less formal change management, of course we need formal change management, of course we need program management. But increasingly, in, the, in a world which is much more complex, with health and care um, coming together more, um, uh, a shift on, on health and prevention rather than just the delivery of health care, you know, it's much more about choreography. It's about being the kind of uh, improvement leader who's a system leader, who, um, who choreographs, who brings things together, you know, who enables. Okay, more and more young leaders at the um, at the uh, uh, heart of change, and we really, I think, need to be working with our residents, with our students, um, with our, um, our with young managers, with newly qualified staff, because very often, uh, you know, they've got uh, they've got ideas and approaches that need to be part of what we're doing. You know, much more virtual connectivity, and I want to show you an example of that in a moment. You know, working through our super connectors. Who are your super connectors? Okay, less change programs and more change platforms. And what we mean by that is a change platform is a space where people can come together and can uh, discuss and they can connect. And some change platforms are are face to face, where we you know we create a workshop or or a situation where people can learn together. Um, or they may be virtual platforms. Okay. A lot of the time, and when we're when we're we're posing things, we talk about top down versus bottom up change. Okay, that's not going away. But but what we're also seeing is, in a sense, we're having to turn our systems inside out, because you know very often in the past when we talked about the healthcare system, the healthcare delivery system, it was about a formal system that did things for patients and, and families that were outside the system, and and now in a sense we're we're shifting that actually. Um, patients and families and citizens are the system. They're at the heart of the system and, and everything else needs to be around them. And what we're also seeing is more, more middle-edge change because, you know, and one of the things that often, I think there are a lot of myths around, are around the, the, the role of middle managers. And people say, oh, middle managers are the blockers. You know, middle managers stop change. Actually, uh, frontline supervisors and middle managers, where they are equipped and given the power for change, are some of the most effective change agents um, that we that we know. And um, you know, when we talk about the interface between old power and new power, when when we can actually create um, um, space for middle managers to work with both old power and new power at the same time, they are some of the most effective resources um, for change. And um, and if I was going to forecast anything over the next period, it's the rise of um, of the um, the middle led um, improvement leadership. Then, um, finally, on here on the right hand side, you know what we're what we're um, seeing more and more of is um, is change change cycles. You know, um, change processes that are like 30, 60, 90 days. And the reason why I think is um, is pretty obvious because we're moving. Um, you know, we're moving away from a world which is about two year, three year, four year change programs. The world is happening so quickly, change is happening so quickly that we have a two year change program. You know, we get to the point of um, of two years time, and um, and what we're coming up with is obsolete. Okay, uh, and it ties in, I think, with a lot of developments in terms of. Um, uh, of design thinking, uh, you know, rapid improvement cycles, and even in really big complex changes, we're seeing this absolute shift um, to 30, 60, 90 day, uh, 90 day cycles. And I just want to show you a particular practical example of this. 
So some of the work that my team um, are involved in is around about transforming perceptions of, um, of nursing and, um, and midwifery. And, you know, we have got 40,000 vacancies for nurses and midwives in the NHS in England. And, you know, even children as young as uh, five or six years old, they see nursing as firstly a female role and secondly as a subordinate role. And we have to, to change how people perceive um, nursing. And even if you, um, you go on Google and you, 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 know, you Google images of nurses versus images of doctors, you can just see the kind of subtle influences. Uh, you look at these um, you know, um, images of nurses and they're all like, they're predominantly female, they're nice, kind, smiley images. You look at images of doctors and they're mostly male and, they're, and even the women here like in power poses. So what we've been doing in England is that we've been running a, uh, a, a campaign around, uh, around changing perceptions of nursing and, uh, and midwifery. And um, what we've been doing is working with, um, with thousands of, uh, of frontline nurses and midwives. So, um, so we, um, we ran an ideas platform. We got... Uh, um, about um, about 22,000 contributions to this, and as a result of this, we've created a series of 30-day challenges, and we've got 2,000 local ambassadors around the country, uh, frontline uh, nurses who are supporting this, and every month we have a, a different challenge. So I'll just maybe pick a couple. So in our July challenge, we asked nurses and midwives to write a blog about achievements and innovations in nursing and midwifery, and we got 600 nurses for the very first time wrote, uh, wrote a blog and the, the content of it's phenomenal actually and we're having it uh, formally evaluated because it just tells us so much about the situation of current nurses and um, in April uh, we've got arranged a meeting uh, with your MP and what we're doing is we're working with the parliamentary team of the nursing unions to have a situation where nurses hundreds of nurses all over England will invite their local members of parliament to come and have a cup of tea with them and, uh, you know, and really change the way that uh, hopefully uh, politicians uh, perceive uh, nurses and, uh, and get to see it for, what, for a brilliant uh, profession that it is. So, you know, think about this. So we set these 30 day challenges, but it wasn't like they weren't done in a top down way. You know, they were developed with, um, with thousands of, um, of, uh, of uh, frontline nurses. And I just want to show you one more project before I end. Um, and, uh, and this project is called uh, it's Project A, uh, which is A for Ambulance. And, uh, and we've just had uh, published a couple of weeks ago our new uh, long-term plan for the, uh, for the NHS. And it's, a, it's um, I think there are some phenomenal, amazing things in this plan in terms of where our, our health and care system is going. And um, I'd recommend you Googling it and, uh, and having a look at it. But one of the things that's mentioned in this is um, this, this project, which is, called, uh, which is called Project A, which is about involving thousands of frontline ambulance uh, um, uh, teams in, uh, in, uh, in enabling change to happen. And what Project A is about is about unleashing the collective brilliance of people who work in ambulance services. And, you know, what we found was happening is that very often when it comes to ambulance services, um, there's lots of uh, ambulance crews, um, control room staff have got brilliant ideas for innovation and improvement, but there aren't very many mechanisms uh, for them to be able to contribute. So, and um, what we did was, um, was uh, my team, we, we um, are working with every ambulance service in, um, well, across Britain. The, there's, uh, there's 10 ambulance services in England, and then we've got Welsh, Scottish, and Northern Ireland ambulance services have uh, joined in as well. So we started last year, 28th of June, and we had 180 frontline staff, and we designed this program together. We set up a ideas channel, and we got 31,000 interactions um, with this uh, with this ideas uh, channel. And the key way that we did that was we found out who were the influencers, and we worked through and with the influencers as well as um, as well as the uh, the formal system. So here's the launch day on the 28th of June, uh, when uh, when we uh, decided what we were going to do. 
and um, we got we got everybody to make films you know this is the age of imagination you know we're moving to a world that's about creativity and innovation and film and and none of the um, ambulance colleagues that we work with had ever made a film before uh, by the end of it every single one of them had made a film and then we created this ideas platform uh, we got 608 ideas and uh, and what we did we worked with a um, a decision-making group, which was a complete cross-section of people to say, what ideas should we work in? Again, what we did, um, at the same time as we had this ideas uh, platform happening, uh, we, uh, we ran Twitter chats. Um, so every week that we had the ideas platform open, we had a we had a different Twitter chat on a different challenge for, for ambulance colleagues. And even though this Twitter chat was, it was one hour, on average, 500 people came to each of these, hour, these hours. And again, what it helped us to do was to understand who the influencers were, to work out with them and keep, uh, keep working um, with them. Um, what we then did was the thing about ambulance staff is you can't keep bringing them to face-to-face -face meetings, you know, because we can't release people from their clinical duties very easily. So everything had to be done virtually. So what we then did was we took the, we, the decision-making panel, identified 12 ideas, and then we had a two-day process that was completely virtual to, to test out um, these these 12 ideas with people across the, the country, every ambulance service took part in this. And, uh, and what we ended up with, uh, where we are now, is, um, is topics that we're working on, and we're working with, uh, with frontline staff from every um, ambulance service. So we're working um, out how we support uh, and respond to people who fall, uh, how we respond to people uh, um, with um, mental health challenges and emotional distress, um, our partnerships with the wider community, staff well-being um, we've taken 70 of the ideas and we've published them in a directory of ideas for improvement and you know the kind of key thing that's come out of this is just so many of our colleagues both old power and new power the formal system and frontline colleagues are saying we want to do um, we want to do virtual collaboration so this two-day approach that we uh, we did to test out the ideas 198 people um, took part in that and you know, it was um, it was 98%. Um, it was 98% virtual. Okay, we have to work in these ways. So really, finally, you know, this is all about power. You know, power is shifting, and I think my biggest message around change in a changing world is to address these issues of power. And we know we might say, well, I haven't got any power, but you know, I think it's important to think about the power that we have got. You know. Um, uh, you know, very often as a saying, you know, the only people without power are the people that give it away. And these figures here come from Harold Jarchi, who is a wonderful Canadian leader on knowledge management. And he says, if you look at research, what it shows us is, first of all, the 25% figure. When you've got a minority group pushing a new idea, where it's below 25% of the total group, the efforts fail. But when you can get 25% of people you know, taking on this new idea, the actual rest of the population adopt it really quickly. And actually, if you've got a group of people that are real zealots and have got an absolute unshakable belief, you can start it from a 10% position. And then finally, we've already talked about the 3%. You know, um, find your super connectors, find the, 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 the people who can make change happen. You don't need to be a super connector yourself, but find and build new power relationships with your super connectors. And, uh, and that's one of the key ways that we can make change happen. So, so back to Chelsea now, I know we haven't got a lot of time for uh, questions and answers uh, left, but I'm, I'm happy to, to stay a little bit longer if, um, if anybody wants to ask me anything or there are any particular comments. Perfect. Thank you so much, Helen. Um, perhaps we'll maybe just flip uh, the um, the agenda a little bit, and we'll we'll just let people who need to go uh, be on their way. I, I know that uh, you had graciously offered to uh, address any questions that people have uh, through Twitter, so uh, I know that you've made that welcome. Um, yes. So, 
I, I do just want to uh, give you uh, a little preview of uh, a thank you gift that's coming your way. Uh, so we've developed at the Health Quality Council, I don't know if you can see these, but this says, yes. I love QI socks. And these oh, will wow. be headed to a mailbox near you uh, in, oh, in very short you. order here. Um, so I know what folks on the line are probably thinking uh, is, well, how do I get my socks? And so I just want to put the invite out to folks that uh, if you would like to be the proud owner of a lovely pair of I Love QI socks, uh, we invite you to become a QI Power Hour speaker yourself. Uh, so you'll see just an address on the screen uh, that will also, being will also be shared out through the chat uh, for folks to sign up to become uh, QI Power Hour speakers as well. Um, I do just want to mention our, our next upcoming uh, QI Power Hour session. Uh, for those folks who are interested in keeping their learning going with our next session. Uh, so just as a reminder, we offer QI Power Hour on a monthly basis. Uh, so our next session will be uh, Feb Wednesday, February 27th, uh, and we're excited uh, to be profiling uh, our very own Sherry Furness, uh, who has recently taken some training in uh, graphic facilitation. Uh, so I don't know that you can read that, it's a pretty small graphic, but um, the definition here is uh, graphic facilitation is the process of translating complex ideas and words into words and pictures uh, in real time. So uh, you'll make, you probably will have noticed that uh, Helen herself is uh, a pretty big fan of sketch notes. She uh, used them a lot in her presentation today. Uh, we often see them come through her tweets as well. Uh, so if you're interested in learning more about uh, this type of approach and the benefits to uh, both you as a, as a learner and using graphic facilitation to enhance your own learning, uh, as well as the impact that it can have in your developed materials, we welcome you to join us uh, next month for our session. Uh, so yeah, and, and Chelsea, can I, just, can I just say as well on that, absolutely. that you know, in the, in the age of imagination, this is an absolute core skill. So I think that's a beautiful transition from what I've been talking about um, today. And, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, being able to sketch note is nothing to do with anything about um, uh, creative ability or artistic ability. You know, um, this is a core skill for the future, and I'd really recommend um, everybody to join Sherry next month. Well, thank you for your endorsement. <laughs> Uh, so with that, that's kind of the, uh, the end of our time together, but um, since you're okay staying on a few minutes later, uh, I think that we can shift to some of the questions that we're seeing come in, if that's okay with you? Yeah, absolutely. Perfect. And so there's some great, we'll, we'll there's some great questions as well. Yeah. Excellent. We'll plan to stay on for uh, another 10 minutes just to give people a sense of, um, of the time that we're aiming for, uh, and I'll read through a few questions here. Uh, so there was quite a bit of discussion around uh, the topic of um, leveraging some of your staff and even your patients um, with the use of social media um, and a little bit of uh, questions that came around that in terms of um, some privacy implications of that and um, medical legal problems uh, when we start to go that route. So do you have any kind of advice of uh, what parameters perhaps to put into place in, yeah. in that arena? Yeah. So I. So um, you know what I what I would um say, Chelsea, is that um every organisation needs to have a, a so a clear social media policy uh, that that keeps that keeps everybody safe, and we we need to work um you know within uh, really clear parameters. And I think that all of us that are um that are tweeting in what can be perceived to be a professional capacity, um. You know, uh, you know, really, sh you know, must follow um, uh, social media um, policies because they're there to keep everybody um, safe. And um, and I think that um, you know, lots of um, uh, professional organisations have got um, got very, very good, uh, uh, you know, advice, um, advisory um, uh, materials. Um, you know that that we can follow. And you know what I'd say in terms of social media is is um, is basically um, don't don't say anything on social media that you wouldn't say to somebody um, to somebody face to face. Um, so I, you know I think it's about um, uh, you know never doing anything that is um, that you know is beyond beyond the boundaries of um, of, of what is appropriate um, uh, uh, professionally. Um, uh, but um, you know, have you seen your organisation's social media policy, and uh, and to make sure um, that that uh, that you're follow, following that. And I think you know sometimes it's um, um, uh, 
uh, you know, I, I think there can be some grey areas. But um, uh, you know, if if you're if you're not sure, um, don't do it. And then and then the other thing I'd say, which is not so much about um, uh, you know about the the, the policy, it, it's just. Um, like be the person you really are on social media. So it's about um, being kind, being generous, um, you know, being being positive, uh, uh, being relational. Because because that way, I think you really get the power. Excellent, great advice. Thank you, Helen. Uh, and this is kind of a nice segue to uh, another question that came through. Um, the comment, I guess, that uh, it's challenging for some people to break out of hierarchical structures, so specifically uh, to share opinions that are not officially endorsed by their leaders. So what advice would you have uh, for that? Um, so, um, so um, you know, what's, what's really interesting to me is if you look at some of the evidence around, um, around you know, people that are able to, like, rock the boat and stay in it, so to be people that um, that can challenge and um, uh, you know enable change to happen, but still manage to stay um, uh, in a in a corporate setting. I think the knack of this is is to be able to conform and rebel at the same time. So so you know one thing I'd say is um, in in terms of um, uh, uh, you know, being a being a rebel, being a boat rocker, um, uh, you know, being um, you know, being able to create the conditions for improvement in terms of challenging the status quo. Like we have to be the very best corporate citizens. So you know, we have to be the people who, um, you know, um, always get their business plans in on time, who are never speak badly of anybody else in the team, um, always turn up on time. Uh, you know, um, uh, you know. Uh, be um, be generous. Never ever speak badly of anybody else in the organisation. Um, always be positively promoting the organisation uh, for what it stands for. Because it's only if we conform in that way that we create the space that enables us to, um, you know, to to rebel. So I think before we start doing anything else rebellious or challenging, um, I think we have to do we have to you know be conforming um, in. Um, in a uh, in a in a good way first. The second thing I'd say is that if you're in an environment where it's not psychologically safe um, to um, to 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 speak out or to challenge, then um, uh, I, I think you you uh, you have to find other people and other ways of um, of, of doing that. So. Um, you know, some of us are very lucky because we've got great line managers who give us air cover, but not not everybody's got that. So, um, so um, you know, if you're in that kind of environment where it doesn't feel safe or it doesn't feel people are supporting you and protecting you, and you have to go on working in that environment, and even when you're a great corporate citizen, um, then reach out and find other people who think the same way that you do. Because, you know, um, uh, Nobody ever changed an organization by standing up and challenging um, uh, the powers that be all the time because we know when you do that it's it, you know um, very often it means you're going to get you're going to get knocked down um, but actually finding other people that think the way that you do getting involved in some small projects and um, getting connecting what you often find is that your small group then becomes a big group. But, you know, I mean, the thing we always say is you can't be a change agent on your own. So if you're not getting the support um, in your own part of the, in your own team or part of the, the system that you need, and you have to stay in that team, and you're, even where you're being a good corporate citizen, you know, find other people that you'll connect, you can connect with. Because, you know, that group could end up changing the world. Brilliant. Uh, conform and rebel at the same time. I love that sentiment. Um, so I think that we'll take one last question, uh, and then we'll let you um, we'll, we'll let you get on with your evening there. Uh, you're yeah. probably <laughs> getting ready to, to head home. Uh, so our last question um, is: Can you give us an idea of? Can you describe an organization that effectively integrates old and new power? Uh, what does yeah. that organization look like? Yeah. So what I might do, um, Chelsea, if it's okay, is I'll, I'll talk about some individual leaders that I know that do that really well. So when I think, um, you know, when I think about the chief execs in um, in organisations in the NHS that I um, that I really respect and I think get the best results, um, you know, it's not to do with, um, uh, you know, their financial position. Um, 
you know, so much of it is to do with having leaders who can work in both um, old power and new power ways at the same time. So, um, you know, when I'm, I've, just, I've got, you know, one or two of them in my head when I'm saying this. Um, what do I see them doing? So, you know, they, they, um, they're formal leaders in a, in a tough system and they take, you know, they take the accountability and, um, and they, they make things happen. But, you know, the ways that they work are in intrinsically new power ways. So they're, they're reaching out all the time um, to, um, uh, to their, uh, you know, to colleagues across uh, across the whole system, um, they they work in ways. So when we're trying to we're cr trying to create some um, some new change, you know, they'll they'll bring people from across the organisation um, together um, to do that. And those leaders often have got a really strong personal narrative. You know, they, the way they tell their own um, story, they do it in ways that um, that enable other people to see their values. You know, they'll show vulnerability. Um, a lot of these leaders, by the way, are active on Twitter and other social media um, and other social media challenges. Um, they, um, uh, and, you know, what I'd say is they're highly developmental. They'll, they'll take risks, they'll be creative. But I think, you know, um, there's, there's lots of organizations that I know that do, um, that do old power and new power uh, together uh, well and uh, and and you know and get great results uh, and very often it's the leaders at the top of the organizations that are in, that are that are working with both and and in the same way we talked about Mandy being a super connector and the way that she was reducing ambiguity i think that's what what really good leaders do you know they work with in with both old power and new power in ways that give a strong sense of meaning to people a strong sense of purpose and uh, you know, uh, and, and reduce ambiguity. Beautiful. I think that last question really kind of brought home the, the essence of your talk. Um, so I, I see that we're at the time that we committed to. Um, I'm very impressed that so many people stayed on the line with us. Thank you so much for uh, giving us some of your additional time. Uh, so with that, I will uh, thank you so much again, uh, Helen, and we'll encourage you to Keep an eye on your inbox for uh, your, your little reminder of uh, your time spent with us at, on QS yes. Hour Hour. Um, and with that, I will wish everyone a happy Thursday. Thanks for joining us. Yeah. And thank you, Chelsea. And also thank you, um, Laura and Heidi and, and Caroline. Brilliant. Thank you.